Our presentation now is keep it simple plan for meeting total phosphorus limits in biosolids. Our presenter today is Ken Windrum. He has 40 plus years of experience in the wastewater operations and management industry. And he has been involved in facilities that have been over 50 different facilities from 50,000 gallons per day to 450 million gallons per day. So with that, I will turn it over to Ken. Thank you. Um, the bottom line is I'm just basically a simple old wastewater operator. So you might ask, well, how old? Well, my first wastewater job was with a company called Envirotech. I started September 7th, 1976. And I'm sure many of you remember that day. That was the year of the country's uh, bicentennial, just, just to remind you. Envirotech at the time was the largest water and wastewater manufacturer in the US. And I worked for their solids handling group. I used to cook, dry, and burn sewage sludge for a living. It was lots of fun. Since then, I have worked for Midcalf and Eddie, Stearns and Rogers, Southern Electric Company, uh, Waste Management, and then I went to back to U.S. Filter, um, where I was the project manager for the Honolulu Uli Water Recycling Facility in Honolulu. It was design, build, own, operate project for U.S. Filter. Um, we made ten. It was a 13 MGD plant. 10 million gallons a day was Class A water and um, two million gallons a day was RO water, industrial water for the Campbell Industrial Park refineries and power plants. Um, as, you, as we know, Vivendi, Veolia bought, up, bought US Filter and I was in line to be the project manager at the Spokane County plant if Veolia had won the project. I thank the Lord on a regular basis that CH got the job and I was able to leave the dark side of the corporate world and join the force of the public sector. All right. Now that you know about me, I need to know something about you. How many engineers are here? Show of hands. Oh, that's disappointing. <laughs> How many O&M people? Okay. How many managers are here? All right, good. Those are the people I'm really wanting to talk to. How do I move this thing? Here we go. All right. So we're going to talk about what we did at HARBS, the Hayden Air Regional Sewer Board, HARBS, um, what our phosphorus removal story is. All, as you most know, all the, river, all the treatment plants in, along the Spokane River have had down to 0 0.05 parts per million. Well, we have a unique way to do that. We're going to talk about our tertiary treatment system, the unique design approach we use to, to get here, uh, what we did for procurement, and contractor pre-qualification. And then we'll talk about the biosolids plan. So I always start with a clean water story. Every day, homes and businesses discharge pollution to the Hayden Air Regional Sewer Board or to your treatment facilities. Pollution includes showers, soap and water, good old number one and number two, washing dishes, and this pollution we have no issue with because we know how to handle that. What we don't want is this stuff, the trash, all the evening monthly disposable wipes, fats, oils, and greases. We don't want people to dump their used motor oil down the drain. And my latest kick is I, if I could be king for a day, I would outlaw garbage disposals. And the reason being that, as you all know, this stuff contains carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And what are our effluent limits? Carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So if you keep, don't give it to me, I don't have to spend money to get rid of it, take it out. Uh, so at the, clean, the treatment plant, we take out the grit. We take out the stuff that should have gone in the trash. And then we're left with an organic soup. And that is actually a beaker of our, our stuff downstream of pretreatment. Those aren't our bacteria. We have different bacteria. Um, but we rely on this bacteria to do a full conversion of the organic stuff into a different product, and that's biosolids. So basically the plant's a bacteria farm. Bacteria produce clean water and they separate when we give them the opportunity to do it. The clean water is disinfected for reuse and irrigation. 
The bacteria become biosolids for agriculture, and it's a great product for the farmers. And this is my environmental protection team. Every day, 365 days a year, we protect the Spokane River Valley Rathen Prairie Aquifer by removing pollution that comes from homes and businesses. But our clean water is not clean enough to meet the new Spokane River DLT and DL water quality standards. In 2012, the plant was meeting all the requirements, all these requirements, except phosphorus. I think our phosphorus going out was in the one range, sometimes less, but in that range, not 0.05. So how do we remove phosphorus? Well, I'm, I've been doing this a while and I find that the KISS principle is usually the simplest way. Keep it simple. It's usually easier and cheaper long-term in in, with respect to costs. So, but the facility needs to set clear effluent standards in addition to its biosolids goals. You can't focus on biosolids and have it generate something that creates effluent issues. Talk more about that in a minute. So in phase one, we enhanced our biological nutrient removal. You know, there's a white paper from the EPA that says you can do all this in an oxidation ditch, which we have. And you can, it's just difficult to control it day in and day out. So we grow bacteria to suck up phosphorus. That is the only way phosphorus is removed from the plant. You can't get it to evaporate because I think the boiling point of phosphorus is four or 500 degrees Fahrenheit. You ain't doing that stuff. Um, so we take phosphorus from seven to nine coming in and reduce it to less than 0.5, 95% of the times. Actually, lately it's been more closer to 0.2. This is our influence screens. To me, this is a good day. Not only do I have all the trash, but I'm starting to take out organics. The less organics I have going to my plant, the less electricity I have to buy to buy to deal with it. And someone in the audience is gonna say, we're gonna run out of carbon. There's a concept, food to mass indicator. If you have less food, you need less mass. Balance it out. Um, we went with hydro head cell uh, separating system. Pat just did a talk this morning. Very few people were there. Um, th there's a series of trays. I don't know if you've been to the mall where there's a parabolic shape, kid put the penny in, it goes round and round and round and falls out the bottom. We have five of them. We operate the grit pump continuously and we pull out as much stuff as possible. It's really a combined, it's condensed primary clarifier. And where does that go? That goes to the landfill. And in Kootenai County, the landfill caps each cell and they pipe the methane coming off of it to their cogen units. So uh, the, the public, uh, the Solid waste manager tells me, yeah, have them send me all that as, as, as much as you can because I need the carbon and I don't need the carbon. Um, the next thing we did, which is huge in my book, is we did influent control. We put in an equalization tank. We have a BNR control valve, which we set at about 300 gallons a minute. Um, I'd like to get back the engineering dollars and hours I spent coming up with some scheme to control that. We set it at 300 gallons a minute. So in the morning, when we get 1,800, 2,000 gallons a minute coming in, 300 gallons a minute goes through the BNR control valve onto the plant, and the rest goes in the tank. At night, when there's nothing coming in, we take and take the stuff out of the tank and keep a steady flow. So here's a week-long pattern, diurnal flows. Every plant does it. Tidal wave comes in in the morning, it goes away in the middle of the night. So the top one is our influent. The bottom one is our effluent flow meter. If you're going to use bacteria to do your work, you need to provide them an environment that they thrive in. And steady state is what bacteria like. They don't have accelerator pads. They don't like up and down stuff. They like because when it goes up, you change the FDM. When it goes down, you change the FDM. And they have to respond to it. And it puts stress on the bacteria 
your workers to get the job done. When you have constant flow going through, they perform better. The other thing that this does for us, we had, it's 100% flow equalization. One day we had a situation where we got a high low chlorine alarm on the effluent. The guys went out, grabbed a sample, verified it in the lab, looked at the rotometer in the chlorination room. Ball, little ball was right where it was supposed to be. What did the staff do? They shut the plant off. They closed the BNR control valve, turned off the pump station from the EQ tank, and then went out and tried and find the problem. The problem ended up being one of the little plastic tubing that goes from the top of the tank into the vacuum system. It was sucking air instead of sucking chlorine. Rotometer didn't care, but the chlorine residual in the plant did care. They fixed a little piece of pipe, they turned the plant back on. Huge, as a manager, that's a huge risk reduction for the entity. If we have a problem with the plant and they're questioning what it is, they don't, I don't, I find out often about it later. Oh, we shut the plant down because they have the capability to do it. How many of your plants can shut the influent flow off for six to 12 hours? Raise your hands. Moving on. Biological nutrient removal tanks. Um, I had uh, some of the guys that I worked with with filter um, provided some input. One of the real, one of the big things was the RASD night tank. I mean, if you talk to Dr. Coates or the guys at the Clean Water Services on your RAS, if you're, if you're nitrifying, denitrifying, if you send nitrates into a anaerobic tank, the bacteria is lazy. They'll work on that nitrate molecule long before they work on the phosphorus molecule, All right? So the D night tank, I think, is the other thing in our system that makes it work real well. Then we have two anaerobic tanks. Phosphorus comes in seven to nine. You know, we'll go 28 to 40 milligrams per liter phosphorus coming up out of the anaerobic tanks. We then flow through the anoxic tanks doing their thing and then onto the oxidation ditches. On the anaerobic and anoxic tanks, we have surface floating mixers. This started with um, um, Larry Esfeld with Esfeld Engineering. Um, the nice thing about it, it's simple. If you do a structural beam across there to put some mixer in there, you have all kinds of engineering costs and structural costs to deal with. Here, we throw this in there, tie the wires to the, the wall and you're done. And these effectively do mix the tanks very well. And then we went on to oxidation ditches. This was put in with my Jim Kimball and, and um, Larry Esfeld. Um, I run all kinds of aeration systems. A lot of them, um, blowers and pipes into the ground. And when there's a heavy rain, the, the ground bubbles. Um, I even ran a, act, uh, an, act, an oxygen activated sludge plant that had a union carbide cryogenic oxygen plant on site. Talk about a carbon footprint. Turnarounds on those things are a pain in the butt. Worse than, worse than cleaning a digester. Um, I like this, it's simple, no duct work. The mixers are inside the building. The gearboxes have been changed with Schaefer's oil. We check them about every six months, send them to the lab, get the results. We only change the oil when the lab says it's time to change it. That saves labor. And that ends up to that four little word that I don't like, cost. So the less we have to change oil, the less cost I have in labor and the guys can do something else. Uh, we actually run these things so that um, the first pass where there's the internal recycle comes in and the influent comes in off of the BNR, um, that's at a high RPM. The second one in the racetrack is reduced down. In fact, we have a right, do I have a, I don't, do I don't have a pointer with this? I don't see it. No, all right. There's a probe right here. There's the probe. It's sampling the dissolved oxygen prior to the internal recycle pump, sending the mixed liquor back up to the anoxic tank. That's at five Q, five times the influent flow. And as Dr. Coates will tell you, 
You don't want to return oxygen to an oxic tank. You're defeating your purposes. So we run that probe set point at about 0.3 DO so that we're not sending DO up to the anoxic tank where you don't want oxygen. So yeah, simplicity, low maintenance, and very effective treatment. The next thing we did, we looked at the clarifiers. We had two clarifiers, 25 foot diameter, and the guys were telling me they never could get the draft tube to work. Well, I worked with a lot of draft tubes and I couldn't get them to work. And, it, and the reason being is that <clears throat> the connection between the rotating parts and the fixed bridge, there's a seal, it's a rubber seal. Well, they don't work very well. And you don't maintain the hydraulic difference between the stuff on the outside and the Raswell inside that bridge. So we went with the spiral sweep and ras ring from West Tech. The spiral sweep, as you can all imagine, draws the solids towards the center. And it's this ras ring that really is the key because the pump, the RAS pump inlet, the suction <laughs> comes right out those little holes in the bottom there. So it's sucking directly up. It's a direct connection to the RAS and we get tremendous performance out of these clarifiers. And we went with West Tech as opposed to Einco or Evoqua, whatever they are today, because Evoqua wanted to waste off the RAS line. That's not an uncommon practice, but we wanted our hopper left. Because when we do the RAS and WAS suspended solids, we can get two to 3,000 milligrams per liter higher concentration in WAS than in the RAS. I mean, that just saves work down at solids handling. The other thing we did, and I can't take credit for this, I stole this from Burley, Idaho. We submerged the flock tank weirs, baffles rather, flock tank baffle. Normally the baffle is high enough, the solids get contained in there and they give you these little tiny holes for the solids that will never come out. By having them submerged when we have a denitrification issue in the clarifier, which no one ever does, right? Um, it just flows out and the sweepers take it out and it goes away. What you're seeing here though, is what happens most of the time. The clarified water is actually flowing down into the flock box, taking the solids down to the bottom of the clarifier. I think that's pretty neat. So phase two was going to take BNR from 0.5 was our design target down to less than 0.05. Um, we're, built, we're building a water treatment plant behind a wastewater plant. It's as simple as that. And you, most of you have done it too. So we focused on having a solid contact clarifier to convert any dissolved phosphorus, you know, the stuff like sugar in the tea I'm drinking, into a chunk. And then we're gonna have, have ultra filtration remembers, membranes remove those particles or chunks. Simple stuff. Um, the solids contact clarifier, there are two types of coagulants, alum basically and ferric. I hate ferric with a passion because when you spill it, it's just terrible. Alum's not that much better, but we chose ferric because it makes biosolids. I have a soil agronomist, believe it or not, he has a master's degree in soil chemistry. God, that sounds painful. Um, and he says, the ferric phosphorus molecule in the field becomes a slow release fertilizer. So eventually that ferric phosphorus molecule breaks down, the plants take up the phosphorus, the ferric slowly, so it's looking around in the soil, seeing what else it can time up to the better for the benefit of the, the farmer. Another rule, no ferric recycle to BNR. I listened to a bunch of presentations where people are putting chemicals in the front and trying to get BNR work. My guys say, don't do that. They say, don't do that. So we have designed the plant that when we're using ferric, none of the ferric products end up back at the head of the plant to impact BNR. It's just a piece of pipe is all it is. Um, ultra filtration, it's proven technology. All the treatment plants on Spokane River are gone to ultra filtration uh, or membrane filtration. We're doing pressurized membranes, not submerged. I apologize, but I hate cranes. They're expensive. 
they're difficult to maintain. You've got to get them certified. Some plants, if they're big enough, you got to have the operator certified, the operator crane. And when you have a crane, you need two bodies. That's labor, which is that four letter word cost again that I don't like. So, and I, I went to a GE thing down in Vegas. They were coming out with this new methodology to get a different uh, bubble size to come up through their Z-weed process to knock the crap off. Give me a pressurized vessel with a very confined hydraulic environment and you get much better performance on a regular basis. CIPs are done in place. You'll push a button, make sure the chemicals are there and you go do something else. Membranes remove bacteria. We all have effluent limits with bacterial requirements. So there's a twofer here. Not only do you get your phosphorus out, but you're starting to take out bacteria. I've been to a plant down in southeastern uh, Idaho. They have a great BNR system. They put in multimedia sand filters. You don't get bacteria removal in multimedia, and they're very good filters, don't get me wrong. They meet the phosphorus requirements, but for a few extra dollars, capital-wise, you get the bacteria out. 100% flow through all the membranes. I know there's some facilities out here and I'm looking at two of them in the back um, and other places, they like to do blending or bypassing. Those are not words that regulators like to hear. It makes them nervous. There's no really finite stuff in the Clean Water Act on it. Um, my membrane plant in Honolulu, when we started up was a 2MG plant. We're making 400,000 gallons a day. I had six MEMCOR units, I ran them all. If you ever read the detailed description from a manufacturer on how you pickle or store a membrane system, you would never do that. So 100% flow through guarantees that we make good water all the time. And I don't know if the regulators can't point fingers at us. So here's a dis particle distribution. Um, here's the bacteria. And as we go this way, it's small and a reverse osmosis here. Uh, alpha filtration here, micro filtration here. Here's your bacteria. Here are your viruses. This is what our membranes are going to remove. So we will get all the bacteria. We will go all, if not most of the most of the viruses. So we will meet our we will meet our effluent limits from the membranes just because of the membranes are E. coli and total coal firm. The E. coli is easy. It's the total coal firm in the summer for reuse water that's a pain. Takes more effort, more chlorine. So we are gonna continue with chlorine disinfection. Uh, the initial facility plan in 2012, we were gonna put UV in. I ran a medium pressure UV system in Honolulu. Okay. I know what UV is. UV uses more electricity than chlorine. That medium pressure system almost dimmed the lights in Honolulu when we turn it on. UV requires more maintenance. You got to change the bulbs. You got to make sure the wiper system's got the right chemicals to get the scale off the sleeves. You've got ballast and you've got other electronics that periodically fail. And another thing that happens is the cell, the reactor that the membranes are in will oftentimes grow stuff. And when it grows stuff, the coliform bacteria you're counting hides in the stuff they grow, falls off and ends up in your sample in the back and you've got issues with meeting your disinfection requirements. I, I know I've been there. And it's so much more complicated than chlorine. The program to take and look at transmittance, the output of the lamp. I mean, it's, it, it takes a PhD to fully understand it. Our staff has been working with chlorine for decades. They know how to, they know the safety with it. They have an excellent safety with it. And it's an easy product and it's effective. Um, <clears throat> so, um, procurement. We're changing subjects a little bit. Beware of your options. 
as an entity, you have different options for how you acquire the equipment and systems you need. And you need to know your state's purchasing laws and requirements. Then you have to CYA, contact your attorney, okay? And you need to have a heart to heart with your attorney to have him or her understand that you wanna go down to the bone on the state purchasing requirements. And yeah, you can take the easy way out and just hand it off to the engineer and pay 10 to 20% of the total cost in engineering fees. Not an issue. If, you, that, if that's your program and you got the money to do that, have at it. But if you do not have all that much money and you wanna control things, you need to look at other options. And you have to have your attorney on board because when, when things go to hell in a hand basket, they're gonna get involved and they need to be involved from day one. Sole source equipment procurement. People think this is a real difficult thing. Uh -uh. You can get the equipment you want and not just the lowest cost specification bid. How many of you have written specifications and ended up with a vendor you really didn't want? <laughs> so what you have to do is you have to find a unique feature or equipment spec for the desired equipment that you do want to live with for the next 20 years. Here's an example. Here we have four different types of biosolids turners in a dryer. On the upper left-hand corner is a Suez project. It's got a series of rake that kind of pushes along and yes, it turns it over. Uh, in the lower uh, left-hand corner, that's Parkinson's mole that runs around there like a beetle and just kind of stirs the stuff up. Um, this one in the right-hand side bottom, it's similar to the, um, the Suez one, except it has different, it just basically turns it over. And then up in the upper right is Huber's uh, turner, where it actually picks the material up and drops it. Picks the material up and drop it. And what that does in the process, it helps to keep it aerated. The other thing we has is that that picking up can act like a shovel. So at the dry end, you pick up a shovel full, take it to the wet end, and it helps with the drying process. We wrote a specification, a sole source, that needed to have something that picked it up and carried it, and also picked it up and dropped it. Tertiary treatment systems. Tertiary treatment systems, we came up with a, a sole source that said, we wanted only manufacturers who could supply the solids contact clarifier and the filtration equipment. How many of you can vision that you got two different companies, the contact clarifier company and the membrane company, and it's not working and they're pointing fingers at each other. By having one guy do it, provide both, you eliminate the finger pointing. So we went with West Tech, because at the time, they're the ones that were doing it. Uh, Avoqua wasn't really doing much in clarifiers. They tried to give us ceramic stuff and we were doing with membranes. So that wasn't in, that wasn't list. So, so West Tech builds tertiary equipment every day, tertiary membrane equipment every day. That's what they do for a living. They are experts in the field. <clears throat> Wrote a performance guarantee. It said, when we get all done and get this thing running, if it doesn't work during the first five years, you have to replace it with something that will work. That motivated West Tech corporate to do pilot testing. And this is the actual solids contact clarifier uh, that they brought in. They brought in a membrane skid with, a, with our predicted um, membrane. And we actually, I actually upset the plant we started out at about 0.5. Before they left, we had effluent phosphorus at nine. And the SEC basic chemistry took that nine down to 0.02. The membranes were doing almost as well. And then we had them design the equipment. Now, there's a bunch of engineers out there who know how to, who do systems, but West Tech does it every day. We had S West Tech design our tertiary system with the solids contact clarifier and the membranes. Um, JUB did the interconnecting piping between stuff, but it really was a West Tech design and they were really terrific. To, I learned about teams 
through West Tech, and it was it's it was a teaching an old dog new tricks. Temporary storage and pump stations. We have a situation where our 5Q through the mixed liquor RAS going up to anoxic. Well, when the power goes off, the internal recycle pumps go off. We well, got all this 5Q water sitting up on top and it comes out the back of the plant in the range of 25,000 to 35,000 gallons all at once. Well, I can't, can't have it overflow and run out into the airport. So we need to have a storage tank to take in that tidal wave that comes down. Um, same thing with the membranes. We have three skids, one skid in backwash, two online, no issue. We have three skids, one in CIP, clean in place. The second one goes in the backwash. Now I've got one skid out of three run. So we needed to have a storage tank to deal with that cycling. As we come up in adding more and more skids, it becomes less of an issue. But day one, it was an issue. We sole sourced an HPDE tank, pump station and storage tank provider that had a minimum diameter of 10, 10 feet. Many of you go to West Tech, Wheel Light, they usually bring one of their sections of pipe that's 11 feet in diameter. That's where I got the idea from. And we had Wheel Light design our storage tank and pump stations. Uh, JUV gave him a, a basic idea of how they could be done. Wheel Light said, that looks nice, but we'd like to do it different because it's cheaper and easier. I cannot say enough great things about Wheelite and how they provided, designed and provided the equipment. Um, normally they're known for stormwater retention systems. This was not their first, but one of their biggest uh, pump station storage systems for our treatment plant. Um, we had all these pieces, uh, we, we did this in December. And then we did this right after the, the HDPE facility in Houston froze when the power went out. And these guys buy enough HDPE material that they were first priority as it was, as it was started up. Um, we did, as you can see, we did it in the wintertime. If my, my superintendent over this section, if everything had been sitting on site and we didn't do it in December, but did it, it when we did, because we had to heat the tanks up to do the welding. Um, if it was warm weather and everything was sitting on site, he would have done all this five days putting them in, welding them, and starting the backfill. That's a labor savings. That is a cost savings. So I suggest to you that as you move forward, that you really do consider using HDPE tanks and pump stations. The other thing, another four letter word we don't, contractors and owners don't like is coatings. When you do HDPE, there is no coating issue. It's all done. So we had uh, West Tech design the solids contact clarifier and ultrafiltration. Uh, Huber did the biosolids turner with aqua engineering. I decided to work with aqua engineering because my facility was gonna be the third one they had done. So I anticipated one third the mistakes than the first one. Um, we alike designed the pump stations and storage tanks and ABC Nucor did the buildings. Um, here we have our um, metal insulated panel building and structure. ABC builds buildings all the time. How many don't have time? My, oh, geez, I better work. Um, <clears throat> here's the, the dewatering building. Here's the solar dryer building. They do this stuff every day. We had them do the design of the building because that's what they do. Um, purchasing options. Look at government approved pricing. If the government is approved a pricing, being a government entity, you can tap onto that. Piggybacking. If someone buys a Vactor or a pump or something and they got a good price on it, you should be able to piggyback on that price. Check with your attorney. Um, GSA, the Government General Services Administration, they have pricing. We use SourceWell to build our metal insulated buildings because they, Nucor gave Sourcewell a price and what it was, it was a, a basic price for the steel in the buildings. The next thing is with the purchase agreements, do you assign it to the contractor or do the owner keep it? And this depends on the owner's staff's experience in, the, in doing it or not doing it. 
But if you're going to assign it to the general contractor, you have to have a really strong legal document to carry in all the pitfalls along the way. Um, we purchased the, the equipment directly. We retained the purchase agreement um, that we had. I had been working with these people, some uh, West Tech three years. So I had a relationship with these people and the general equipment were purchased by the contractor. And then we had to have a contractor. Pre-qualification of general contractors. We developed a questionnaire to review the contractor so that we knew that they could do the job we had for them. Um, you do the questionnaire for this early. You start this when you start design. You give them a project description of where you are. You're, you're probably 25% into your design. So it's pretty conceptual, but you give them an idea what it is. And then you look at the contractor's experience. Does he just do septic tanks or has he done tertiary treatment facilities? There's a difference. Uh, is his project similar to yours and he's worked with similar dollar values? Then you have pre-bid meetings. These are in person. Let me repeat, in person. And the reason is they're in person. I want to know that the people who might be working for me are motivated enough to persist, participate in the process. Team meetings or Zoom meetings, people can be doing all kinds of stuff and not really paying attention. And no exceptions in person. We had a situation on the uh, one meeting. There was a company out of Boise. Their plan was to take the 8 a.m. flight to Spokane and be in Spokane at 8.05 our time. Guess what? The flight was canceled. We made the mistake of letting them stay in. They should have effectively planned better and come in the night before. Don't, don't, no exceptions. And then contact equipment suppliers. You all buy stuff from equipment supplier, Global Samson, um, uh, Joe Buckman with uh, APSCO. Talk to these people and see what these general contractors are to work with. They're Hallstrom tank covers, the aluminum tank covers on top of our um, EQ tank. They won't work with one of the local guys. They will not. And it has to do with, pay, with, do with getting paid. Um, and then look at other projects. Ask, ask the people around that you know that this guy's a work for. Uh, Pre-bid meetings. Review the design. Seek input from the contractors. In our phase one, we had a rectangular tanks for the EQ tank. One of the contractors says, put in a, a round tank. JV's engineer structure guys say that saved project over $100,000, not insignificant. Um, and review important spec section, concrete tank, concrete tanks crack. But you need to have everybody understand what a crack is and what mixes you can use to minimize those cracks. And leak testing, specifically identify what the leak test procedure is. We came down to the fact that if a Scotty's tissue would stick up against the wall, it was leaking. Um, backfill materials, there's all kinds. Uh, decide on what you want. Submittal times, you want to live in it when you get submittals in. And then you want format. This is what we did. We required the submittals to blank out equipment that you're not receiving. It makes it so much easier to review the process. Five, 10 years down the road when the equipment's broke and the, and the tag information is gone, you can go back and easily determine what you want to rebuy. Um, submittal time limits, yeah. Notice to proceed, submittals have to be in by X day or liquidated damages. If you don't get the submittals, you can't get the material coming to you. Um, what we did, we started with six general contractors. We ended up with two that submitted bid and our preferred contractor won the bid um, and also brought with him the, the best electrical contractor. And the contractors like having the electrical contractors included in this review, um, because you can get some guy that just does housing, provide him a load bid number to the general contractor, and because he's looking to save money, he'll take, uh, let's see, um, again, contact your attorney. You need, in the design, you need to look at things that you might be able to do without. Um, and I don't know, I didn't know how to word this, but um, the, the, the example is in, in the first period, the engine, the electrical engine, these concrete beams surrounding the duct banks. 
But we took that out and just did a fill with gravel, pea gravel, and put a concrete sidewalk over the top. It was like a savings $180,000 in the project. That saved money that we could use to increase activity because you always got to find stuff that you forgot you have to do. Um, we'll do biosolids real quick. Every plant makes clean water and biosolids. We're a 2MGD facility, BPR activated sludge, um, biosolids waste holding tank and a screw press. We make class B solids that require incorporation and we are installing tertiary treatment, meaning that the solids that have been going out the effluent, they're in the biosolids. Um, we had a requirement for full class B at final disposal. Control your own destiny. We lived through eco compost up and down. Parker egg showed up and left. So we wanted to have control of our own destiny. No biosolids odors at the plant or at the, at the field. Um, we store 15% biosolids. The, there's lots of water, there's lots of carbon, there's lots of nitrogen, phosphorus. The bugs start eating and doing what they normally do and they start to fart. And people don't like bug farts. It's simple as that. So we needed to do something about that. We wanted a long-term process because it's gonna be our initial investment. And we wanna limit phosphorus and nitrogen recycle within the plant. We did not wanna, I've got an effluent limit with phosphorus. I don't wanna have something in the plant site that's generating so much phosphorus that I gotta work overtime to get it back up. The same thing with nitrogen. And meet the farmer's need for no-till farming. Aerobic digestion, lots of tanks, lots of blowers. Anaerobic digestion, lots of phosphorus recycle. Anybody here, struvite? Sounds like me. Anybody ever clean an anaerobic digester? Lime stabilization, I hate lime. Goes all over the place. Composting, a labor intensive process. Heat drying, relatively simple and a solar option. This was the original numbers for um, the project. Uh, and the difference, the numbers that's not in the anaerobic digestion, aerobic digestion is the cost to recycle the nitrogen and phosphorus. We went with Huber as the, with the equipment supplier. We did not go with the, the greenhouse like this because when I went to Tawali, the engineer asked the operator, how many pieces of glass have fallen out? To me, that's labor and costs. Uh, we went with Huber solar dryer with our turner. We designed the house to be 325 feet long, 90, 90 feet wide with two turners. It's a, a greenhouse design based upon Edmonton, Canada. The northeast and west sides are metal insulated panels. The south side is grazing, glazing. That's what the material will look like. And we bought with Ceres. Ceres is a greenhouse manufacturer that uses metal in uh, insulated panels on both on three sides and they have this ground to air heat transfer system. In the summertime, we take the warm air, put it through the ground, make a, make a heat thermal battery underneath. October, November, we suck that heat out, take the ground back down to 55 degrees. The moisture in the air goes through the ground in the wintertime and we get latent heat of condensation. And as you remember from your physics class, you get a thousand BTUs, ballpark, a thousand BTUs back out by going from water vapor to water. So that's the system that's there. Um, this is what it looks like in reality. You have to backfill it. You know, we did this during the winter. We then put insulation down, rebar and PEX tubing. And yes, the machine rolled on top of it. And the PEX was pressurized to 100 PSI and we were waiting for a line to break and have a volcano and it never did. This is the building going up, more steel going up. This is what it looks like today. This is what it looks like on the inside. And we have two huge um, radiant uh, condensing heat boils from Cleaver Brooks to provide plenty of heat for the floor. So we're gonna meet full class B, greater than 75% solids, reduce our truck load trips from 65 down to 17, and more biosolids opportunities in Idaho. That's all I got. All right. Thank you, Ken.